Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the HPC Best Practices webinar series, which is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project funded by the XA Scale Computing Project. The series is a collaboration involving the US Department of Energy computing facilities at the Argonne Oak Ridge and, uh, and the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. I'm Osni Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley. Ashley Barker from Oak Ridge and I will be the host for today's webinar. SQL, Introduction, Introduction Best Practices, and the webinar will be presented by Thomas Atoncourt from uh, the Argonne National Lab. Thomas is an assistant computational scientist at Argonne. Uh, he's interested in high performance computing and has been working now in Aurora, uh, which uh, will be the first X scale US system to be delivered in next year. And he's interested in various programming models like OpenMP, and of course, SQL, and low level programming as well. We have sold a very large number of, we're very happy, tickets for this uh, webinar, more than 350. Uh, and all attendees have been muted by default. And we'll be receiving questions through the Zoom chat and also the Google Doc. These addresses have already been pasted into the chat feature in Zoom. I will do it again. And the webinar will have a break so the speaker can respond to the questions that come in. So with that, I'll um, um, stop my sharing here. And Thomas, please, you can uh, start your um, presentation. Hi everybody, thank you for the introduction and thank you for assisting my talk on SQL, introduction and best practices. So we'll start with a, a light introduction just to explain why SQL maybe have an interest for you and some of the core concepts. Then we'll go after theory. In theory, we'll talk a lot about SQLs, the underlying concepts they use, and uh, maybe it will be uh, too much information, but it's just to give you an idea. And then we'll do half an hour, 20 minutes of live demo, so you can, see, you can see concretely in real life how SQL behave and if SQL is maybe a good fit for your, for your code or not. And at the end, I will have some conclusion. So we'll have some break of each of these sections, so don't hesitate, don't to hesitate to, to ask questions either in the chat or more preferably in the Google document. So quick introduction. So first, why we need SQL and how it is a state of in HPC. I guess it is a news for nobody that future exascale uh, system and future large system will be accelerator based. So you will need to be able to offload to this accelerator to be able to, to target. Most of the time it will be GPU, but maybe in the future it will be something else, FPGA or whatever. So the question now is how, what programming model should you use to be able to use those accelerator? One of the traditional way to do it, it is OpenMP. So OpenMP is pragma based. So that means some people doesn't feel comfortable using OpenMP in the C++ land because you cannot put, for example, pragmas in variable. It's hard to do if statement with pragma. No, it is possible with new OpenMP spec, but it's kind of strange to be able to do really templating and this kind of uh, type of programming that you can do in C++ with OpenMP. Then you have CUDA. CUDA is really low level and it is proprietary. So that means it targets only NVIDIA. So for example, to announce uh, exascale system, no, uh, no exascale system in the US will use NVIDIA. So if you have a CUDA code, you will need to port. Then you have HIP, who HIP is like uh, CUDA with a small modification to not be sued by uh, NVIDIA. And it was developed by AMD. So it is open source, you can find it on GitHub, but it is only targeted for AMD and, uh, could, and uh, AMD and NVIDIA and only for GPUs. So, and it is really low level, really verbose. Then you have OpenCL. OpenCL is really like the, the grandfather of everybody. It's really well battle tested and everything, but 
inside our community in HPC didn't get a lot of traction because maybe it was too verbose. So it, it lets us, we need something who feel like C++, who is C++, and who can really target a lot of different kinds of cage. This is why we, we saw the development of Cocos, the, the famous Raja2 or Oka, who are high level abstraction layer. So it feels like C++, we can use template. But both of these free run are uh, academic projects. That means they are developed by a few, but smart people, but they are really not a big team. So it may have problem. It's not clear if they really be sustainable in the future, if they, are, if they are here to stay. So they are passing the good direction, but they are still academic projects. So I think what we want and what SQL was designed for is like, it is designed to be really targeted for C++. So if you like C++, and by C++, I don't mean C with classes, but I mean the new C++ with lambdas, with a lot of functional programming IDs, you, you may like SQL. So it's really like C++, you have no language extension, it's purely C++, no pragmas, no attributes. It borrowed a lot of concept of uh, OpenCL, so that means they didn't reinvent the wheel from scratch. They reused a lot of concepts who, who were working. For example, it, it's reused like this platform, this device, this one group, this range. So that means you still have some documentation about the concept used in SQL, but they make it really more C++, so really less variables, a lot of abstraction. It is single sources, who is nice for, for I think HPC developer, it's still more natural. So you just have your kernel and the, all the API to launch your kernel in the single file, where in uh, OpenCI, for example, or in CUDA, you need to have in two different files. The key novelty in SQL, and I think it was a really good thing, is this kind of implicit data transfer. For example, in C, to go from C to C++, at the beginning in C, we are like, we need to use malloc. We need to freeze them because we are smart compiler. We'll never be able, smart enough to be able to handle memory management. After we realized it was maybe a mistake, so we create C++. And in C++, all the malloc and free are mostly hidden with the scope and constructor descriptor. And they took the same approach here for accelerator where most of the data transfer are hidden from you with the compiler who will do it for you. So you will create accessor, we'll talk it a bit more later, and buffer that will encapsulate your data. And after using this accessor, the compiler will be in the runtime, will be able to understand what kind of data movement you need to do and try to optimize them. And maybe most importantly, SQL is really a specification developed by the Kronos Group, who is a really a big group, who is a nonprofit where you can just join. And they already have a large background of projects they did. They did OpenCL, they did Spear, Spear V, Vulkan in the graphic OpenCL. So that means it is really, a, it's really public, everybody and a lot of vendors are working on it. As a proof, Right now, it's all the possible uh, single implementation who exist right now that you can try. So the, I think my favorite just by the name is TreeCycle. So TreeCycle is developed by the Xenix company. And it is a SQL compiler who takes SQL and after you can use OpenMP to target any CPU or OpenCL to target mostly FPGA at the beginning. At Argon, we, uh, SQL will be one of the programming models that we support. And for that, we will use Intel. Intel, DPC++, who is their Intel compiler. So it is, sometimes I will use DC, DPC++, and by DC++, I just mean Intel cycle compiler. So with DPC++, you are able to target Intel GPUs, but also NVIDIA GPUs and Intel CPUs and FPGA. So you can try it, it is in public. So it is based on Clang, on NLV Clang. And right now it's, the GitHub is public, so you can just download and install it. In fact, in the presentation, I will use 
uh, later, the live demo, I will use DPC++. And if you go in the repo, I have a Travis, Travis CI, where I installed one API, DPC++, using just the regular sudo apt gate. So it's really easy to install. I encourage you to try if you want to. And in another spec, you have ipsql with a sql and is targeting using heap. So it takes sql and at the, the backend generate heap. So you can target AMD GPUs and that's why it. So this slide is just to show you that right now, it is picked by a lot of company, Intel, Codeplay, Xilinx, and is able to target the vast majority of all the hardware possible. So the goal of this talk is really, it's only one hour, so I will not be able to, to give you really an in-depth expertise of SQL, but just to give you a feel, just so you know if it is worth it for you, if you feel confident porting your code once for all, let's say, to this SQL, so you will be able to target multiple accelerators for a long time. Then I will go through some code examples, so you will really see in the in the real life how it works and everything. And like I say, all the questions are welcome. So just post it on the Google Doc or in the chat window. And we we already have one question. <laughs> oh, so perfect! It is the end of my uh, introduction, so we can I can answer the question. Okay, I have a Windows 10 workstation with an NVIDIA GPU. What compiler tool chain should I use for SQL development? So my understanding is it is on Windows, right? This is what he said. Correct. Windows. Yeah, so I have no experience on Windows, sorry. So if I was in your position, I think I just install a, a VM and after I use uh, either Intel DPC++ with the NVIDIA backend or maybe and or maybe the AMD ipsql if you want to target your AMD, your NVIDIA GPUs. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Um, we will um, uh, Thomas. Uh, we'll ask Thomas to you know to write his answer in the uh, Google Doc afterwards. Please go yeah. ahead, Thomas. No problem. And please, I will ask uh, if somebody have more information about uh, using uh, SQL on Windows, but I. I think it will be supported at some point for sure, but I never tried, so. Okay, so now a little more theory for computer scientists who are here and would like it. So, so as I said at the beginning, OpenCL, a SQL is based on OpenCL concept. So it's just, it just retake a little of OpenCL. So I put you here a, a UML graph of OpenCL. I don't want to go in detail, and uh, it's just to, to give you a really quick concept where at the beginning you have some platforms. So the platform will be, for example, a collection of CPU, a collection of GPUs. And this platform will have a collection of devices. This is what I tell you. This platform will have CPUs, the platform will have GPUs. And at runtime, you will choose in which device to run. And after you will create your kernel, you will build on them into program, and after you will submit them into common queue. So it's like the CUDA stream, if you are come from CUDA. And this common queue is bound to a device and bound to a kernel. So you will take these two together, your common queue and your program, and run it. So this is just, I want to say here, so device, platform, common queue, kernel. And the way if you want to synchronize between kernels or if you want to profile kernels, you can use events here. So you just put events in the common queue and it can give you when it starts, when it ends. So you are able to do some synchronization between kernels. <laughs> so like I said before, the big, the big novelty in SQL and really one of the core concepts is what they call uh, the memory management. So in SQL, you have your data and you need to un encapsulate your data into buffer. So we'll see in the example later, but you have your data, you put it on a buffer. And then you will need to create what they call accessor 
to describe how you will access your buffer. For example, you can create an accessor to just read, an accessor to read write, an accessor to write all the arguments. And because the runtime will know how you will access your data, they can do optimization. For example, if you read your data in two different kernel and you never try to read it from the host, he knows that. So he knows he can just leave the data on the GPU and don't do, do some tra data transfer. So how, it, how they do it's like they can just create a DAG and representation of your data movement and try to optimize every single way. So it's really powerful. And also the good thing is like when you destroy your buffer, one can say it is data, it will cause some synchronization. So they will synchronize the device data and the host data together. So that means lot of lot of the data movements are implicit to you by default. For sure, if you really want to control, you have a way of doing explicit data movements. But by default, it's really to be more descriptive about what you want to do and let the runtime do its best. So like we did in C++, where we just create a malloc, we just create an object and we trust the, the compiler to be able to delocate it, to disallocate this object at the correct time. So we'll see more examples, but I think it's really a powerful concept. And for sure, this one need to a lot of refactory of your code, but SQL allow you also to use unified shared memory, where you can use directly raw data and you don't need to go through all these buffer accessors to ease your transition for maybe another programming, mo programming model to, to SQL. <laughs> so implicit loops, so this one is more from people who are really, who never develop on uh, GPUs or maybe just from OpenMP. So they are not, a, so it's a novelty where is in CUDA in OpenCL is really that you don't write explicit loop, right? You just write your kernel and your kernel will be executed once for each what we call work item. So you can think of a work item like a one iteration of your loop. And for performance reasons, you need to, to bundle each work item into a work group. So it's really similar to, for example, vectorization. You need to bundle them together to be able to coalesce memory or to issue vector instruction. So this is what they call the work, work group with a local work size. And the total number of iteration you want to do is what they call the global work size. So for example, in this example here, I have my loop iteration is 24, right? I have 24 iteration I want to, to, to do, and I bundle them in chunk of eight element. So I have a local work size of eight element and the global work size of 24. <laughs> uh, so here I, I put you how you can do that in SQL OpenMP CUDA and how you should have done that if you want to get the same kind of performance or execution mapping in OpenMP. So I have a global work size of 24, a local work size of eight, right? 24 by eight. You will see in, uh, in the example, you use a parallel four to say you want to you use parallel, you want to execute this kernel in parallel and you just pass your size as an argument and after you execute your kernel. So really easy, it's just you don't write the for loop. The for loop is more or less implicit inside this parallel. And inside your kernel, you can have access to some variable to know in where you are in the iteration space. Where in OpenMP, if you want to do the same thing, you create your first for loop in the work group, where your work group, the number of work group is your local work size in local work size. So here I have three work group. And after inside each work group, I need to go through my little uh, chunk. So for local size to local work size. So it's just a, a nice way to express tiling or vectorization of chunking how, just how to, you want to, to call it. <laughs> so I think now we are ready for the, for the alpha, alpha an hour live demo.
Do somebody have any more question on the on the uh, theory aspect? Yeah, there are some questions here, but I, said, I think one of one of their good folks has been answering, you know, in real time. <laughs> oh, so perfect. We have lots of lot of experts on the call, so don't hesitate. Yes. Okay. Well, so. it's just right. So, yeah, but I, perhaps go. I could just read the questions for so you know, to so you can give your. Well, one of the questions was this. Um, uh, however, much I'd like to develop in C++, a lot of um, HPC codes right now are, are in Fortran. Uh, are there Fortran bindings for SQL? So, so SQL is in C++, right? So SQL is really targeting in C++. Nothing really forbid you to create some ISO C binding and to expose some C interface and after call this Fortran, the C interface in Fortran. But no, by definition is really targeted to, to C++. If you are in Fortran, you, I think the natural way is to stick with OpenMP because OpenMP will have all the, all the features. But so easier, yes, yeah. so easier stick with OpenMP or just maybe modularize your code so you can just expose some C API and inside this C routine just call whatever you want, for example, C code. Okay, another question here about participants planning to port uh, their CUDA kernels uh, and their, the kernels use multiple CUDA warp shuffle intrinsics for sharing data between two CUDA threads. Uh, is there similar support for SQL available? Uh, yes, I think so. You are in SQL, you have this notion of uh, subgroups and everything. So I think it should be possible. If it is not possible and it is really something, so SQL is still a new version of released of SQL. So if you find really something who is uh, missing in SQL, we can just talk to the SQL committee and put it or if you are a Targon, for example, we can work to, with Intel to just put it on their compiler first to see if it is really useful and then put it back to the main uh, SQL community. But I think, uh, yes, it is possible to do this kind of interwar application. Okay, Thomas, please go ahead. So a little uh, uh, bookkeeping for Sometimes people like to know what I am doing, so I will use Arden cluster just for convenience because I have my setup here, but I should have been used anything else. I will use the Intel SQL, uh, so the DPC++ compiler. I will run on Intel Integrific uh, Iris Gen 9, and I think the host in the, is uh, Skylake. And all the example, if you want to, to follow with me or if you already by chance have some SQL uh, compiler and you want to run it at the same time are available on our nice uh, GitHub page. So let's get started. Did you see my screen? Yep. So if you just git clone uh, this uh, repository I sent you, you will have uh, this folder. So in presentation, we put uh, the presentation we already did before and this one, so the slide back here. The example are in the uh, nine cycle of hell folder. So I'm not sure I have the best uh, example, but for sure I have the best name of all. And in this example, you have like uh, nine example, like the the name suggests, and it goes from really simple one, we'll start with this one, to really more complex so C++ glue with font or aesthetic bind and everything. So we can, we'll see how far we can go in this, uh, in this time, but please don't hesitate if you have any question, any feedback to just open a GitHub issue or just drop me an email. So let's get started. So the first tiny SQL info. So this code, this code is just to list the platform and list the device available on your system. So 
So it's really like the, let's say, the inner world of SQL. And it's just to give you a feel that SQL is really like a C++ API. So it's really deep into the C++ concept. So the first thing, we list the platform. So where, for example, in OpenCL, in C, because it is in C, so it's kind of verbose. In, uh, in SQL, it's really easy. You just create a, a vector of platform. And after you have those platform, and just, you just create a for loop. You iterate over this platform. And you can query information about those platform. For example, you can get, you can get their name, their vendor, and maybe the version of the platform use. Just one interesting thing to see here, if you are not aware of this uh, new C++ trend where type is everything. What I do here is get info is a templated function and I overload get info with the type and this type corresponds to what I want to get, right? So get info doesn't take as an argument, for example, the string name. It takes as an overload, the type will correspond to the name. So it's just the SQL, the SQL way and the new C++ way. So and if somebody in the audience is a C++ expert and how, know how I can create a list of type, I will be really grateful because right now you need to create, you, you need to copy paste. And it is a little not really pretty. So I have this list of platform and then I create for each platform, I get the list of device and same thing for each device. I just loop and get some information. So here I just get the name and I just check if it is a GPU or not a GPU. So really simple and you see on this, it's really not very, really like terse, 30 line of code. So it feels really like C++. To compile, I have just a, a, a make file, and you see, it's just I call the TPP, TPC++ compiler, and I use STD17. So right now, I think SQL is just base require 1711, but I think in future versions they will bump the the version of the C++ standards they, they require, and I think they want to to go at the end in C++17. And after you can just execute this uh, little example. And you see here on this particular gen line, I have four platforms. One platform is the OpenCL uh, platform for my GPU. And inside I have my gen line who is a GPU. And then I have another platform which corresponds to my CPU. And I have my CPU. And then I have another platform who corresponds to to steal my GPU, but with another backend, with what Intel calls the level zero, who will be their low level driver, low level API to be able to access the GPUs. And by the spec, SQL is required to always give you a host platform where you can run if you have nothing else. And this is this last platform. So this is a good thing. That means you can, you should be always be able to use SQL. It doesn't matter if you have an accelerator or not an accelerator. It will just run on this uh, CPU, what they call host platform. So you see to compile nothing special, one file with this DPC++ compiler, and that's it. So now let's try to, to write our first kernel. So we are able to get all these platforms, this device, but now let's use one device in particular to submit a kernel. My first kernel. CPP. So first thing first, you need to, to define, uh, you need to say to, to define which device you want to use. For that, you have multiple ways, so, but the most, uh, let's say, practical and high level way to do that is to create a selector. So you create this default selector and when you when you will use it, the runtime will choose for you which uh, device to give you. So for example, here I say by default, just give me one. I trust you to give me the best. But you can say, give me a GPU selector. So I want just one GPU or a CPU, I want one CPU. It's also possible for you to write one. For example, you want to do, 
you have a platform where you have multiple GPU and you want to do some round robin. You want to submit the first kernel to one GPU and the second kernel to the other GPU, so you can create a selector for that. It's really polyvalent. Then you see, I would create some scope. Because like I said previously, scope are really important in the SQL because scope we call destructor and destructor will impose some synchronization rule. So here I create the first, the first scope and I will put my queue inside. And what that means is when my queue will go outside of this scope, I will have some synchronization and it will enforce the queue to synchronize. So I don't need to call Q dot uh, sync or wait for finish. It, it will be implicit at the, at the, when the destructor will be called. So I create a queue. So a queue, like I said previously during this uh, UML diagram is where I will submit my code to. And this queue take a selector. And after I can just introspect this queue to get which devices choose, we have chosen. So here I will just ask for this queue. Okay, please tell me where do I run? Always better to know where I run. Okay, so now those lines. If you are not in C, C++, it looks like a little strange, right? Lot of brackets, lot of parentheses. So in C++11, they, they added the lambdas, and lambdas are just a function without name. Okay, because in my queue, I submit a functor. This is what I do, I submit a kernel. So here, I need first to create a, a command handler. So in my queue, I submit a command handler, and in this command handler, I will be able to create, for example, here, a stream to be able to, to, to do IO, or I will create me, my accessor, will be able to, to express how I want to access my data. So the syntax of the lambdas are first, the first in the bracket is to tell how you want to implicitly get some uh, argument, access global variables. So here we want to access any global variables as a reference. And after the first, inside the parenthesis is the argument of your lambda. So here this lambda will take an handler, will be provided implicitly at runtime. So the runtime will call this function and give it uh, command handler, command group handler. So at the beginning, I remember I was a little afraid, but at some point you just make your mind and you don't need to change a lot. So most of the time you can just uh, understand, understand how it works once and after just copy paste it. So here I just want to print hello world. This is the only thing my kernel will do. So I need to create a stream. I cannot use printf inside the SQL kernel. I need to create a, a stream. So I create a stream. And after here, I will really finally submit my kernel to this command group streamer, command group handler. And it will be a simple task. So that means it will execute only once. And same, it is a lambda where I pass my values. No argument to my kernel. I don't pass anything. And at the end, I just see out hello world. So just to recap, at the beginning, I create a selector. After I use this selector to create a queue, I ask my queue in which device I run. Then I use this queue to be able to submit the first functor or the first lambda will be able to what is called the control group. And inside this control group, I use this control group handler to be able to submit my real kernel. And this real kernel is just uh, a hello world. It just print hello world. So to compile, uh, make my first kernel.cpp. <coughs> so here the first, the question is like first, in which device I will run? So let's. So you see, it choose the Intel Gen 9 Graphic Neo. By default, you say, I will run on the GPUs because I think this is what most people expect. And I will use the OpenCL backend because it is traditionally the one where people use. And I printed a world, so I am happy. 
So if we have time, I can show you on Intel, we developed at Argon, we developed some tools to be able to profile your code, just to prove you that indeed you are running on the GPU. So it is possible to trace of the code. And I can show you later. So we did most of the, we are soon to be HPC now. We have an hello world, so the rest is, uh, will be trivial. The first example is to create a loop. We want to do a little more than just printing one element. It would be nice if we can print a loop. <coughs> Sorry. So at the beginning, is uh, the same thing as just parse some into to be able to, to get the global range. So you remember before it was what I call the global work size. So I will just use pass this global work size as an argument. And for each work item, for each iteration of this global work size, I will just print, I think, my index. So at the beginning, same thing, nothing changed, taking back Q. So here is a big change. Before I was using sing, single task and now I submit the parallel for. So I submit the parallel for and the parallel for take one argument before the lambda. It takes the range. So like I say, what is, in, what is the size of your iteration? What is your problem size? So here I pass a range in one dimension. You can change the dimension. I have example, if you go in advanced inferno, how if you want to iterate in 2D, 3D, it is possible here for convenience, I just use 1D. And I say, I want to iterate over this global, global range. And after now my Lambda take one argument too, and this argument in the index is just a convenience variable will be able to, to tell me in which index I am. So if you come, if you are more familiar with uh, MPI, because in the MPI is uh, a little the, the same thing, the global range is the number of MPI rank you use. So you MPI run N uh, equal, for example, I don't know, 200, you will have two, 200 MPI rank, uh, MPIs, yeah, MPI rank. And after here, you can just get your own rank in which rank you are in this big MPI uh, space. So it's really similar. Or in OpenMP, if you are more familiar in OpenMP or pretty, this parallel four corresponds to OpenMP parallel four. And this range with this kernel, with this index, this line corresponds just for the for loop. For int, you, you start from index zero, index plus plus to the global range. So I hope it, it makes sense. Maybe the syntax is a little, uh, C++ -y. lot of C++ if you are not familiar, but after you already pick up the facility, basically. So at the end, what I will do here, it will print hello world for each world rank. So by default, I think I use a world rank, I mean a global work size, a global range of one, but we can change it and see. So let's end the range.cpp. So it is C++, so it takes a little bit of time because a lot of templating and everything. And let's say I want a global size of 10. And you see now, oh, sorry, I didn't compile the, the good one. Oh, two parallel four. And you see it print for each rank this number from zero to 10. And if you put a larger number, you will see that the output is totally in order. It doesn't execute, it doesn't print in order, right? Because by definition, each work item can execute independently. So the runtime is totally allowed to be able to to execute them at the same time. This is what you expect. So when you print, you have some race condition on the order of the print. So you can have from, for example, here, I have the first work item. And after I have the 96 work item will print to this uh, command, to, to the string. 
So it's a little uh, proof by indirection that indeed you are executing out of order. Hey, Thomas, would this work for any kind of GPU? Yes. Yes, it will work. You just need to have uh, the correct compiler. So Intel, if you use DPC++, it will work for NVIDIA and Intel GPUs, but other company compute CPP, for example, like Sync and Target, uh, AMD or Ipsicle can target AMD. So it just depends on your compiler, but yes. Yeah, th this was a question that came through the chat. So uh, yeah, please go ahead. There are other questions, but I think I'll uh, you know, go ahead and then I'll yeah, okay. Go no, don't questions. hesitate to, yeah. If we start yeah, from the type local question, we can stop. All right. So now, as you, you know, in sometime in HPC, just getting this information is not enough because like the previous question, you want to know in which local group you are because maybe you want to shuffle between different local groups. So that means between this. Uh, so you need to, to have more introspection capabilities. And also you want to play with, the, let's say, the vectorization size, the local work size. So to do that, this is what the ND range allow you to do. So it's exactly the same thing as before. It's just here when you create your, you don't create a range, you create an ND range and you pass your global range. So the total number of iteration, but after you also pass your local range. So how much of them will execute at the same time. So you can think roughly, so it is really hand wavy. This one is the size of your warp, right? You want to say, okay, so 32 will execute at the same kind of time. And now because you have this kind of 2D aspect, you need more uh, introspection capabilities. You want to know really where you are in this big iteration space. So you have all these function with should be familiar for some people if you already did some code or open CL. This get global ID, this is global range, local ID, local range, group, group range. All these kind of functions with totally available will again give you a lot of introspection. And uh, so this is what I run before, 10. And so I want a global row proof of 10 and a local size of five, for example. Uh, and it's not uh, parallel four, it's 3D and the range. And you see here, I am, um, my local size is five. This is what I spend. So, and my group size is two, where, because I execute my thing of size 10 by chunk of five, right? Nothing special. Maybe something I will just tell you quickly is like if you fail, for example, 10 is not a multiple I by three, you will hide this uh, right now as out we wrote this horrible sec 14 at some point and the code just crash. We'll see in the six example error handling how you can just track error code if you want to just recover and not just crash your application. <laughs> so the last thing we need to do to be able to really use it at the production is to be able to do data transfer. And it is really the key thing to do. I mean, the key, the novelty in SQL. So let's start with that. So we see how to generate a loop and now we'll see how to do data transfer. So it's called for buffer.cpp. So here's the same thing as before. We doesn't change. So maybe the only difference is we create a, we create a vector, okay? Create a vector of size global range. And what I want to do is just to initialize this vector with, uh, so the element zero should have the value zero, the element one should have the value one and so on. So like I said previously, you create your vector and then you create, you need to create a buffer, okay? The buffer will encapsulate your data. So it is, it, it will be the first abstraction layer. We cannot use directly the vector because the vector is really a C++ thing and you have nothing to do with SQL and any data movement can happen. So we create a buffer. To create the, the buffer, you just spend the data, a pointer to the first element and the size. And here I use int. And we put it inside the scope because I mean where the buffer will go out of the scope 
the destructor will synchronize and put back the data, will synchronize the data inside this buffer and this vector. So you are sure at the end that your vector have the vector A will have the correct values. So I create my buffer, everything is fine. I create my Q, same thing, nothing changed. And now I will create my accessor. So my accessor will describe how I want to access this buffer. And here, because I want to overwrite all the elements, I can use a mode which is called discard write. So discard write means I will write all the elements in my array. So that means the runtime will understand that, oh, is you in discard write. So I don't need to allocate any data on the, on the CPU. I can directly allocate the data on the GPU. I don't need to do the first data transfer CPU to GPU because I know you will never need to use the original value because you discard, right? So it's really powerful, give you a lot of information. Because to get performance, the only way to get a performance code is just to give as much information possible to the compiler in the runtime so they can optimize it. Then I have my accessor and I assume in my kernel as before. So a range and an ID. And after I just access I just use this accessor and I just use accessor ADX equal equal ADX. So maybe a little subtlety here is like IDX. If you were already uh, vigilant when I saw the parallel for you realize that it was a tuple because it is a tuple of size 1D. If you use 2D, it will be a tuple of size 2. But you have nice overwrite in SQL, so that means you can use directly the the tuple 1D to access your accessor, and it will work. So you don't need to use index bracket zero. And after it is a, a test structure chain. So first, we we form the lambda. It is the name of the lambda. Here it is the end of my queues. So my queues will go, and here I stop my queues, and here it is the end of the scope. So my queue will go out of scope. So that means uh, the queue uh, the queue will need to wait that the kernel finish first, and after my buffer will go out of scope. So that means the data who is inside this buffer will be synchronized to the data with A. And now I print, and when I will print, I hope if it, everything runs correctly to not have zeros, but to have uh, I equal A I. For buffer, global, for example, let's use 10. And you see, indeed, it, it is working. A0 equals 0, A9 equals 9. And uh, you need to trust me because we don't have time. But if you profile this code and you count how many memory you do, indeed, you didn't do any memory from the CPU to the GPU. You did only one memory transfer, and it was from the GPU to the CPU to be able to, to get back the data. So it's really powerful. I think you can start imagining if you, with all this access or how you can really give a lot of information so you will never do any spurious data transfer. But maybe the last one before I take any question is sometime you know when you need to do that data transfer and relying on a destructor can be a little uh, tricky sometimes in your application if you really do some fancy and you're a ninja programmer, like we say. Fortunately, uh, SQL gives you some control. And for example, here I create my, my buffer outside of the scope, right? So my buffer will never be synchronized. So if I try to access my data at the end, it will still have the data on the CPU. It will never be synchronized with the data will be set on the GPUs. So what I need to do is here, I can just create this update host function. And the update host will just force or maybe give, you will give the runtime the order to be able to synchronize. So that means take the data who is on the GPU and put it back on the host. So you have all this control if you want. So then you just need to create a new queue and then 
So it doesn't need to submit a kernel. This one is a kernel, and you just create a, an accessor. Oh, yeah, uh, just before I uh, answer the question, I really recommend you to use auto because the type of the accessor is really maybe, I don't know, five line, line long. So please auto, use auto for the accessor. So if they have any question, I can answer some question, or if not, I can go with a uh, unified share memory and maybe more advanced C++ function. Yeah, Thomas, uh, thank you. Yes, we do have some a bunch of questions here. Let me see. I'm going through the list. I don't think uh, there's a long one, but just to, to tell, like to tell the participants that this the Q and A uh, will be uh, will be sending this to you by email next week with a link to the recording as well. So, but uh, okay. So let me uh, go here. So, is there a library of SQL accessors to cover the common needs of ECP developers? Or do I have to write my own specific my own specifically for my code? So right now I think you have only three types of accessors. So you have read, write, or maybe four times. So you have read, write, discard write, and read write. So this is the only type of uh, way you can express the way you will access the data. I guess maybe in the future, if you have maybe some pattern where really common in HPC application, we try to, to see maybe for example, in open C in open MP, they are like triangular collapse or this kind of or whatever. If you have maybe some really pattern used really a lot in a lot of different kernel, I think it's maybe worth it to to try to see if we can put it on the spec. Okay, uh, another question here for an existing large in, uh, for an existing large application, how intrusive will it be to add SQL? Is there experience how much code change is necessary? So maybe just one so in the side way. Intel is providing what they call the, the DPC plus plus translator, I don't remember the exact name, but it is a tool to take your CUDA code and to transform it into your and transform it into SIG. So it is the first step. So it may help you. So it not mean to be a new compiler. It's really something to help you porting your code. And also for the question is really depend on how your code is architect. If it is architect really in a modular fashion, it should be less intrusive. I guess in reality, most of the code are not architect this way. So I would not like to use changing programming model is always a little painful. But you can use unified shared memory. <coughs> So if you use unified shared memory, you don't need to create accessor and all these kind of things. So you can use directly raw pointer to your kernel. So if you use unified shared memory, it's it's mostly a little, it's really easy to port your code because you just need to rewrite your kernel. And that's it. Another one uh, here. Is there any comparative performance data for a C++ code using SQL versus using OpenMP? To do exactly the same thing. Yeah, so we have lot. So it's really a what can I say? An active research development and area. So I think you should expect in the first. Uh, I think maybe some paper are already published, but in the in the next months you should expect a lot of paper doing that. What I saw by personal experience, but don't quote me on that, is like as always. Most of the time is really similar, and sometimes you can find some particular pathological case where one of the other, I saw SQL code outperform OpenMP, but I also saw OpenMP code outperform SQL. But my understanding is like no nothing in the in both language should uh, both of them should be similar in performance. So it's not like one have more advantage than the other. So so yeah, so I think in the future, we should show more and more paper trying to do this performance comparison. Uh, well, I have a question. I have first uh, first technical question. In your files, there is a include file C capital L capital. It is property of Intel, DCPPP, or where we can get these files? 
Uh, which one, sorry, which file? Ah, in the first line you have include cl slash dot cpp. So what I did, I just, uh, during the seminar, uh, registered on uh, Intel Dev Cloud. And yeah. your stuff there, and there is a, but uh, uh, running DCP plus plus, whatever it is, it didn't find this CL SQL HPP. Oh, okay. so maybe, maybe this but one is I'd old. Like to look at the questions here, please. Okay, so another question here. Is, the, is there a way to see the intermediate processing steps between source code and machine code? Specifically, it would be nice to see what's vectorized and where, how loops, arrays, sizes are broken into files. Yes. Maybe there is an intermediate yeah. representation that has style prefetch information or something? Yes, so, so if you want to be a little more technical, so how it works is like you take your kernel code in for, at least for Intel, it's generated in SPRV. So SPRV is an intermediate representation, pretty similar to LLVM intermediate representation. So you have some flag in DPC++ if you want to emit this one and see it. Then this PRV intermediate representation will be compiled, compiled to GenAssembly on Gen9. So we have some tool also to see the assembler. And after, so you can check everything. If you really, if you want to do that, the easiest way is to use Vtune. And Vtune have some DP++ capabilities, so you can profile your code using Vtunes, and you will show exactly the vector size you use, the global work size, if you have any speed register on everything. So Vtune, we can give you all this information. So uh, uh, Thomas, does the CPU support of SQL extend to Intel KNL? Good question. I have, I didn't try. My understanding is maybe, I don't know. So I, my understanding, if I need to say yes or no, I should say yes, it should work because OpenCL I think should work on the CPU, but I think it was really not optimized too. So the performance should be not good, but if you want to debug, it should be possible, yes. But I should, so but don't quote me on that. I can try to see more information and run some tests. So uh, some people here, uh, Thomas, are comp uh, uh, complaining that I think the code that uh, uh, they cannot compile, they're getting errors, but I think oh. this, has to be, this has to be addressed offline, right? <laughs> yeah, so I think so maybe if so, if it is just from import, let's see, because I run on the dev load most of the time, so maybe it's just a source I will again give you a reproducer. So what you can try is just to, maybe on the dev load by default, they remove, so just use this one, import directly sql.hp and remove this uh, namespace because maybe they remove it from OpenCL, but I will try. I run most of the time of Dev Cloud, so I will give you the how to do how to run on Dev Cloud. Yeah, so so let's let's go. I think we have a, we have a couple of more questions here. How could one express AVX five hundred twelve vectorization exp explicitly in SQL? So it depends. What do you mean by explicitly? If by explicitly you want, I want to to give a lot of into my compiler to be able to to use 512 vectorization instruction. The easiest way to do that is to use this uh, local work size and you put it to, five, not 512, but 512 divided by your, the, the size of your data structure. So 128, for example, and it will force by some definition of force the compiler to vectorize using 512 instruction. And after you can use Vtune to do that. If you mean by explicitly using some intrinsic, I think at some point we will support, I think at least I talk for DPC++, we will support inline assembly, so you will be able to use inline assembly to force the correct size. But just playing with the local work group size, I think it is uh, the way to go to, to force, to play with the vectorization then. A final question here. So again, uh, uh, Thomas will go through all these questions and uh, create answer and create them. Uh, we'll be uh, sending the Q&A to everybody uh, next week. A final question here for the sake of time. Uh, is it possible to use all the LLVM infrastructure for getting structured reports from opti uh, optimization passes in DPCPP? So it's a good question. I think no, because we gen so 
It's a good question. So let me think a little bit about this one. I think it's because it is a different backend. All the vectorization paths are purely for CPU, right? So GPU doesn't generate any vectorization per se. But maybe they implement the same kind of report, vectorization report for some passes, at least before the spear v creation. So I should just check. So I think you can have some information, but I'm not sure what kind of information, if it is a full information. So I will try and go back to you. Okay, so it's 11 o'clock here in California. Uh, uh, I would like to show uh, a final slide. Uh, um, let me share my screen here, Thomas, if you could. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, screen. Thank you everybody for joining us um, for this very nice uh, webinar on SQL. Thank you again, uh, merci bien, Thomas. So, uh, and I take the opportunity uh, for the participants, please give us feedback using this um, link. So we'd like to improve the series. You can also give suggestions for topics for uh, future webinars. As I mentioned, the slides and record will be available next week. Uh, actually, the email we sent to you, we'll be sending an email to, to everybody. And the next webinar in the series is going to be in three weeks, uh, July the 15th, and it's uh, going to be on what's new in SPAC, and the presenter will be Todd Gambling from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And the, uh, we are already accepting uh, registrations for that event. So uh, thank you all again. Uh, it was nice um, um, having you uh, joining us for this webinar. And, uh, yeah. and don't hesitate yes, to send me a question directly if you want. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.